Yeah, it's the same answer. Oh, I see. You rest your feet. Well, thank you. Really, sorry. Nice to meet you. Thank 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 Okay, Mr. Chair, um, lovely afternoon, um, and thank you for having this meeting uh, with my other brother and honorable as well. Um, thank you for hosting us with the shortest possible uh, notice that we could muster under the circumstances uh, that we we'll take this together. Um, on behalf of the team, uh, this is uh, a very noble job that has just been done by, well, headers, the only Nigerian in the organization, and the others who are actually non Nigerian, uh, but most passionate about the plight of uh, the ordinary people uh, who are victims of uh, some measure of corrupt practices and uh, lack of corporate integrity in some of uh, what we call the international uh, multinational corporations and then who are also their own citizens and of course companies where they, their governments have investments uh, and they have really been at on top of the challenges that are unraveling some of the mysteries that surround the um, OPO 245 deal. Um, the House of Bread uh, in 2012, uh, actually uh, set up a committee to investigate the uh, circumstances surrounding the deal and the um, part of the resolution in 2014 was the need for the revocation of the deal. Uh, based on emerging facts at that time, and the failure of uh, the government to do something also prompted your house, uh, and we, we must actually commend the members of the House of Representatives for actually taking that uh, bold step on behalf of the Nigerian people to also demand probity and accountability on, on that deal. Um, we've had reasons to collaborate and cooperate with uh, anti-corruption agencies both in Nigeria, in Italy, in um, the Netherlands, and, and some going in the US, where there are connections with both the OPL uh, 245 deal and some of the proceeds of the so-called criminal enterprise that um, gave back to the deal. And uh, we've just taken a step further beyond our political intervention in the issue to have this economic and fiscal um, analysis and evaluation of uh, the regime of, of that oil uh, law itself and to see if indeed Nigeria is benefiting duly uh, from um, the deal, or if there are other uh, benefits that are accrued to Nigeria from the deal that was not actually uh, incorporated in some of uh, the agreements that were reached between the multinational companies and uh, the Nigerian government. Um, from this analysis, and maybe you've seen it on the pages of which we uh, it was just more or less the most conservative um, estimation of that we are saying Nigeria is actually likely to lose about 500 billion dollars you know, if the deal is to operate as it is, as it is presently. But otherwise, in considering also the gaps, you know, that was not captured in the, in the agreement, Nigeria then would be losing up to about 10 billion dollars. Uh, you can imagine the magnitude of uh, impact this can have on the life of Nigeria itself. So to my right, I will just introduce the member of the team and then um, our consultant, Dr. John Hobart, will speak to some of the technical areas of the report so that it can assist um, your, go to your committee of financial crimes and the whole House of Representatives um, as a whole in actually strengthening your arguments 
um, in, of 2016 where you set up the new ad hoc committee to review uh, the court candidate and then we will be more than available to, to also avail you any other additional material that is required to assist or also even work with the committee on areas that we think they can be assisted to get to the root of the matter. So to the right uh, is the uh, co-founder and director of uh, Global Witness, uh, Mr. Simon Taylor. Uh, to my immediate left is uh, Dr. Dan Howard, uh, who is also the president of resources for development consulting and then who actually came up with the report um, and then he will be speaking to, to that later. Um, to his um, immediate left is um, Dr. Atumu Ikaribu, uh, who is the director with the uh, record um, in Italy. Um, to his left is uh, Ms. Barabi Pace, who is a campaigner with the Global Witness. Um, next to him is Nick Hudiat, uh, is uh, one of the founders of uh, the Coda House. Uh, also based in the UK, like the global West. Um, the common is based in Italy. Um, to, next to uh, Nick uh, is uh, my colleague, Tolao Shutadi, uh, from Heda. Uh, and then the, next to him is Mr. Lamid Damoli, who is also a consultant to Heda. Uh, there's a young man, uh, okay, yeah, uh, the Lincoln Yaya, he is also a staff with Heda Resource Center. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Okay, so um, you want to make comments and then the other thing we we'll do. Maybe let like, um, to his presentation and I'll talk about our, like, what his findings and then we can hear from the general. Really? Yes. Okay, so don't okay. over to you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm going to say just a few words about who we are and what we do so that you understand the context and our credibility before talking about the report and our findings. So I run a company called Resources for Development Consulting and we have one simple but challenging mandate and that is to help resource rich countries get a fair share of oil, gas and mining revenues. We find that in many cases this doesn't happen partly because of an imbalance in expertise between the officials that represent citizens uh, and the lawyers and accountants who represent companies. We also find that companies are very effective in minimizing their tax payments. And unfortunately, in some cases, public officials don't act in the public interest. So we employ industry standard methodologies and we employ world-class experts uh, in order to assess whether governments are getting a fair share. Um, our specialty is petroleum sector and production sharing contracts. We work across Africa. We've done projects recently in Angola and Equatorial Guinea. We do a lot of work in East and Southern Africa as well. Um, I would say that uh, the, the petroleum expert who led our project here uh, was for 30 years with BP, uh, senior executive on the commercial side. Uh, so we understand the business side of this and also the government side. Um, and we avoid any conflict of interest because on principle we never work for the companies. So we only ever work for a government or for representatives of citizens, parliaments, and, uh, and civil society groups. So the core of this project was to assess the value of OPL245. And we believe that the prevailing story about OPL245 is that $1.1 billion was spent to secure the rights to the block. But the story has changed as of yesterday in the publication of this report. The story is now that not only did the companies get the rights to the block, but they got extraordinarily generous fiscal terms associated with those rights. So our analysis is designed to look at the current terms, but to compare them with the terms that were originally signed with Shell in 2003, with the terms that were associated with the reinstatement to Malibu in 2006, um, and with what the block might be worth under the PIFB uh, if the block were to be rebid. So there are three parts of the public debate that we think are really secondary. Was the $1.1 billion the right amount to pay? Uh, we think is a secondary question. Was the signature bonus the right amount to pay? We also think was secondary. Um, and the back end rights to NNPC. Um, the core question is why is there no profit oil for the government in the current 
set of terms. And the current set of terms are set out in two documents, in the resolution agreement from April 2011, and in a production sharing agreement, which is really a joint operating agreement between the two companies. So there is, in this case, no production sharing contract between the oil companies and the government of Nigeria. And that is the reason, ultimately, why the government of Nigeria gets no profit oil. And that is the basis why, as Lamaray said, um, we believe that the people of Nigeria have lost at least $4.5 billion. So let me say just a couple words about our sources and methods before giving you a detail of the findings themselves. In Nigeria, oil contracts are secret. And in fact, the model contracts are secret, which is highly unusual. And in our work across more than 15 countries, we find that where contracts are secret, there's a high level of suspicion, and unfortunately, in many cases, the suspicion is warranted. Uh, here we are working with the original source documents. Highly unusual. I think the first time ever, in fact, that external analyses of the Nigerian oil sector have worked with the original documents themselves. So we have the 2003 PSC. We also have the 2011 resolution agreement and the 2012 agreement between the companies. So we're very confident that we have the fiscal terms accurately represented. Um, and I should say that all of these documents are in the public domain. There are links to all of them in the report. Um, in terms of uh, the project analysis itself, we're working with Shell documents. Shell did a series of economic evaluations of the block in 2009 and 10, um, and these documents are also public. So uh, we have had to update those, those numbers in order to put them in 2018 terms rather than 2009 and 10. But again, we're working with the original documents both on the economic side and on the fiscal side. In our methods, we use standard discounted cash flow analysis. It's what companies use to make their investment decisions every day. We simply turn that methodology on its head and use it to look at the government side of the equation. I should say that for all of our base case numbers, we're assuming an oil price of 70 US dollars a barrel, Brent crude. Um, if you pick different oil prices, you obviously get very different results. So the fiscal terms that currently govern the block and that have governed the block in the past. There are essentially three sources of revenue. This is the way Nigeria makes money from a production sharing contract. In some production sharing contracts, there's a royalty that's paid, but in most, historically, for deep water, there has been a 0% royalty. Uh, so this was the case from 1993 up until 2005 licensing round. In the 2005 licensing round, in the terms that would have applied to Malibu had they kept the block, there was a royalty of 8%. Uh, in, under the PIFB, there will be a sliding scale royalty of between 5 and 10 percent. That's the first source of government revenue, but it does not apply to the current terms because they reference back to the 2004 Deepwater Act. The second source of revenue is the petroleum profits tax or the petroleum income tax, and that does apply across all four. So that's a consistent source of government revenue. The crucial point is that the 2011 deal combined with the 2012 contract means that the government gets no profit oil. Normally, an NPC as a concessionaire would sign a production sharing contract with the company and a share of profit oil from between 30 and 65 percent would be allocated to the government depending on the, the formula in contained in the oil contract. Uh, but that is completely omitted. Uh, from the current terms that govern the block. We could say then that it's actually not really a production sharing contract at all because the core elements of a PSC, cost oil to the contractor and profit oil to the government, are omitted. So what are the findings? I'll talk first about life cycle revenue to the government and secondly I'll talk about the percentage government take. So in terms of life cycle revenues, when we look at the 2003, 5, or 18 terms, the alternative cases, we see that the government makes at least $14.5 billion off of this block over its life cycle. The life cycle is 13 years, the amount of oil is 560 million barrels. And when we look at the current terms, we see that the government makes less than $10 billion. So the difference is at least 4.5 billion US dollars if we compare to 2003. And if we compare to 2005, which are the terms that applied to Malibu after reinstatement, it's 5.8 billion US dollars. Uh, now, we can also analyze this in terms of the government take. 
And the government take is a statistic we use to compare different oil contracts inside jurisdictions or between jurisdictions. And the government take is how much goes to the government compared to the company after you account for costs. The International Monetary Fund says that a mature producer like Nigeria should get between 65 and 85 percent. And when we look at the three alternative scenarios, we see that Nigeria gets between 60 and 65. And this does not come as a surprise because we have all known that Nigeria doesn't get a particularly good share in deep water offshore. Um, it is one of the reasons why the PIB for 15 years has been an effort to get something better. Yeah? But the important point here is not that, that the PSCs are getting Nigeria a bit less than they should. The point is that the current terms get Nigeria only 41%. And that falls completely outside of anything that could be assume, assumed to be reasonable in Nigeria. And it compares very, very badly with any other country in the region. Um, so let me just say that the methodology that we use um, depends on input assumptions and forecasts. And some could say that you know, they could contest some of the input assumptions. Again, we're working with original documents that are publicly available. We're working with shell data, um, and we're assuming a $70 price of oil. There are three reasons why we believe that our estimates are, if anything, on the conservative side. First of all, we think that there's more oil in Block 245 than 560 million barrels, and Shell thinks so too. Secondly, we take into account the costs of producing natural gas, but not the revenues, and there are reasons for that. But there will be more money from the Block because of gas. And then finally, we believe that it's likely that oil prices, at least at some stage over this 13-year period, will be higher than $70 a barrel. Under the different sensitivity analysis that we've done, the loss to the Nigerian people could easily be 8 or 10 or 12 billion under different scenarios. So we genuinely believe that the 4.5 billion is conservative. Um, it is probably an underestimate of what it will really cost Nigerians. We had did a press conference in Lagos yesterday and someone was pressing me on why we hadn't included some of the other elements. And I said that I actually think a $4.5 billion loss is probably big enough that something should be done. <laughs> so let me just conclude with two sentences. Traditionally, it has been believed that oil companies paid $1.1 billion for the rights to OPL 245. We now know that they paid $1.1 billion not only for the rights to that block, but also for extraordinarily generous fiscal terms. Fiscal terms that fall way outside what's normal in Nigeria. Um, and we believe that the consequences of that set of fiscal terms for the Nigerian people are a loss of at least 4.5 billion US dollars. Thank you. So, I'll just follow that up by explaining um, what Clay Willis has published uh, off the back of Don's excellent analysis. We report, uh, published this new report uh, this week. We take the future and shell scandalous deal for Nigeria as well. As you will probably be aware, Clay Willis and our partners sitting around this table have been investigating the OPL 5 deal very solidly for five or six years at this point. And Actually, I have records of us talking to Shell and raising concerns about this deal going back to 2008 at least. Um, this is not a, a new issue for us, and you will recall that in previous years we've published uh, leaked Shell emails that showed that senior executives of the company were briefed that bribes were likely to be paid from the money they were paying for this license. That's, of course, at this point a matter for the courts, and this case has sparked an unprecedented criminal trial in Milan where Shell, Eni, and some of their most senior managers are all standing trial for international corruption offences. A situation we've never seen before. No company the size of Shell has ever gone on trial for bribery internationally. Um, that trial is, of course, continuing, and I should note that the company and the executives and all their other defendants uh, claim their innocence and, and, are, and are contesting those charges. Uh, I'd also um, say that, that those prosecutions and uh, the international effort to, uh, to <coughs> deal 
in this case has been a real credit and show you know, what can be done. Though that case and uh, the amount we know now would not have happened without efforts by Nigerian law enforcement, Italian, British, US, uh, Parliament here in the, the House of Representatives investigation that took place, as well as um, civil society and some fantastic Nigerian investigative journalists probing into this deal. What we published on top of Don's analysis today is uh, findings from um, emails that we've published on previously but shed new light in this new context on this deal. And they show that Shell's most senior executives understood that the deal they were asking for was not a production sharing contract. They say it very explicitly and yet maintain in the contract terms signed in 2011 and 2012 that it is a production <coughs> sharing contract and that's written into the contract language. They were aware that this would be controversial and were it to come to light there would be calls to, to change the deal. And they were aware that Nigeria would lose their uh, share of profit oil and that this was unprecedented in this situation. Then you also may have seen that there's been publications by the Nigerian press today and yesterday, uh, notably Sahara reporters reported on other emails that they clearly had access to which showed NMPHC officials noting that this was a one-off and unprecedented from their perspective. And we also published uh, a letter that came out with Nigerian court proceedings from uh, the director for the Department for Petroleum Resources just two weeks before the deal was agreed, calling the deal highly prejudicial to the interests of the federal government. And looking at the terms that were signed, it's hard to not to conclude that the concerns of Nigerian civil servants were ignored or overruled. And in our view, we should be listening to those concerns now, and in Global Witness's view, this deal should be cancelled when these, these terms deprive Nigeria of the equivalent of twice the national health and education budgets combined, according to, to Don's, as he says, conservative analysis. So that, that's where we leave this in, in Walker's, and we really hope we can work together to find the truth in this deal that we've been working on for so long. Okay. Thank you. I don't have anything to add, I think. Um, Super common, which is that the cumulative work we've been doing over the last five, six years, we have brought together the different skill sets, experiences, and access to different jurisdictions of our respective organizations. And so I think what we bring to the table is potentially um, uh, you know, a team who can help you as appropriate. Uh, and we would like to offer that. And I think in the final um, submission from here, um, we would really want the um, National Assembly, uh, House of Rail, to your committee and other committee um, related to the oil and gas sector, to also be present on um, the Department of Petroleum Resources, to actually come forward to the parliament what are the physical and economic terms and uh, conditions and situations. Our an expert analysis from the Nigerian government, especially from the office of DPR and NPC, of the fiscal and economic um, regime surrounding the OPL 245. Uh, that actually is very important. Uh, we're very sure it will either confirm some of the things that are presented there or it will validate some of them as well.
express his uh, gratitude for the kind of confidence you have in this house, in particular the National Assembly in general. The next task we have is to come here as well to be part of the, to, to the visitors and to give us some of your expertise uh, uh, without paying for it. <laughs> we know how valuable your opinions are. We are not taking you for granted. So we have very nice to work. Uh, as you might uh, recollect, this same National Assembly, the House of Representatives in uh, 2014, after two years of investigation, because an investigation was set up, the committee was set up by the National Assembly, the Seventh Assembly, and to investigate the same issue. And after two years of investigation, in 2014, uh, we, there was a recommendation uh, that the, the, the uh, there should be a cancellation of this uh, contract, and uh, unfortunately, the last uh, the last administration of President Jonathan did not do anything uh, to carry out the investigation as the recommendation of the National Assembly. And uh, again, in November 2016, flowing from the failure of the former administration to uh, do what we, the National Assembly asked them to do. And uh, in this since the seventh assembly recommended, as I said, the application of the, uh, the cancellation or the cancellation of the, of the contract. And because of the failure to do that, uh, the current eighth assembly uh, also set up a committee to an ACO committee to look into this, into this matter. Uh, I know just from what you have said, uh, because I don't want to repeat what I put here, because it appears as if I'm, I'll be repeating almost everything you've said there. But it's very important to say that I, I have the opportunity of reading some of the findings and new discoveries. Uh, that is very important, based on outcomes of investigation by world class oil experts, particularly uh, the resources for development consulting, which uh, further unearth useful facts pertaining to the outstanding issues in the hideous oil respecting contract. Uh, we talked about the issue of the 1.1 billion. Uh, of course, the 1.1 billion was paid to Malabo, and uh, the signature uh, uh, bonus uh, was supposed to be paid to Nigeria, and nothing was paid. Uh, we have come to realize that, uh, far from that, it's over 6 billion uh, in loss to, to Nigerian government. And this is a new discovery. Which also from what you have said, and from my interaction also with the head of the, the, the chairman, we discovered that some other things were not uh, put into consideration while putting the value at 6 billion. Uh, exactly what you just said here, uh, the issue of the gas was not even put in place at all. And these are things that are uh, continuous daily basis. And it also does not take into consideration the dynamism oil market. So it's just uh, a conservative estimate. Uh, if you want to put it, it will go beyond that to what would uh, amount of about 10 billion or more. So it's exactly what you have said here and uh, we believe that some of the, uh, the recommendations and the assistance you want to give to us, the National Assembly will be willing uh, to, to, to work with you to ensure that uh, we uh, give justice to this matter. I am, as you know, the chairman of the House Committee on Financial Crimes, and one of the problems, one of the things that we are doing in this assembly is to uh, join the, the federal government, the president, the war against corruption. And uh, everything that we have said here is a function of corrupt society. Um, it is a function of corruption. Uh, of course, uh, without corruption, we will not be talking about a certain amount of money or you know, this kind of contract. That are supposed to be for the benefit of the entirety of Nigerians is being cornered by an individual or a group of people with the connivance or collaboration of uh, the multinational corporations, the IGF, the NEL, and, and, and other related organizations. So, what am I saying here? Um, we in the, in the House of Representatives would uh, welcome any assistance, we welcome or any. Um, because of your own investigation, I know there is a trial in Italy as we talk, and I know that 
line has been going. I told him that any time you want to go, you should let me know. So that I can also join you and be part of that. Very okay. welcome. I told him that. I told him that I, 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 he would, he can tell you that even the last time he went, when I called him, he said he was in the clear. I said, doing what? He said, for that case, I said, you know, because they, they have committed something different from others. You know, the society, when you see, when you come to a corrupt society, you see they bring a lot of, a lot of justifications to, to, to back up corruption. And uh, when you are fighting corruption, they tell you, well, is it because it's not from your tribe? It's not, is it because it's not, it, it doesn't belong to your government? Or is it because it's just criticizing you? You know, they find all sorts of uh, uh, reasons and excuses to justify corruption. The corruption is corruption. And I said it also, I've said it over and over that even in the, in the, in the, in the, in the southern government, we have people that are corrupt. And nobody is saying that this government is, uh, is simply that we don't have people that are corrupt. But I've always told people if you see any sign of corruption anywhere, write a petition, it will be investigated. But so far, I don't want a situation where somebody will say, I am not the only thief. Don't tell her what I want is I've not stolen. <laughs> they don't say that I'm not the only one. You know, well, unfortunately, you are the one that has been caught. So you have to face the consequences. So, uh, so far, um, we will do our best. We will uh, participate in whatever uh, uh, events or uh, investigations that we want to do. We will also, uh, we may be extending our invitations to you to give us uh, some of your findings because we also have our committee that is working on it and uh, we know very well that uh, this government is uh, very particular about it we, we, we are very serious about it of course that I know some people will say that the government is being lethargic but it's not like that uh, we have to also follow the process you know, unfortunately uh, the first time this administration is quickly coming to an end but government is a continuum. So whatever thing that we started, we believe that uh, there will be a continuity in it. And we also believe that God willing um, this uh, president, the president administration will be going to be returned uh, next year so that we can continue the war against corruption. But uh, by and large, we also have discovered that one of the reasons why uh, corruption thrives in our society is because of uh, lack of uh, institutionalization of corrupt, uh, of anti-corruption uh, agencies, as well as lack of adequate uh, laws to govern uh, to, to, to govern this uh, area. So what we have done so far in the eighth assembly is to pass so many laws that will institutionalize the war against corruption, so that it will not be dependent on the will and purpose of a particular regime. Uh, well, once we have uh, we have, we have uh, stable institutions in place, even if we have a bad regime. We have a very strong uh, anti-corruption agencies like EFCC, the ICPC, and other agencies. Even if that government is a government is weak, with a strong institution, but with very strong laws, they will be able to do their work. Uh, a lot also depends, of course, on the strength and, uh, of course, the character of the Attorney General of the Federation. Uh, I know that as I'm talking, I'm sure you'll be wondering also what is the position of the Attorney General of the Federation. <laughs> Uh, I know, I, 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 can, I can guess that at least so far, so of us, some people are not comfortable. And really to the left side, or my left side here, uh, there is a lot of uh, agitation on what is the uh, position. You know, the Attorney General Federation is very strong. Uh, the Constitution provides for the expansion of the Office of the Attorney General Federation. Apart from him, there is no other. Uh, minister of government that has any such provision in the constitution. Um, and with that power, he has the power to also enter a law. And that's a very strong, very powerful weapon. Uh, he can discontinue a litigation. They said that he cannot go to it. But in Nigeria here, he can discontinue a litigation for no reason. And he doesn't have to give any reason for the right. But well, I can tell you that uh, since the beginning of the administration, that power has not been used, at least on any politically, uh, uh, politically
regardless post person. And this matter is a combination of politically exposed investigation as well as international cooperation. And of course, it has a semblance of international international um, dimension too. Because even if Nigeria does not do anything, as you can see, Nikki is going on there. The whole world is looking at Nigeria. And we also want to show Canada to the whole world that if the other parts of the world can be very interested in what goes on in Nigeria, we that are the custodians of people trust in Nigeria should also make sure that we do the needful. That is what we have to do. We don't have to be we don't have to rely on you to do our work for us. We should only, only ask you to give us your expert opinion. What because I belong to and an anti-corrupt agency, and I know that very well that doing our work, the corruption has taken international dimension. So you cannot do everything here in Nigeria. A lot of, uh, and corrupt people are always one step ahead. And that's why Nigeria, we, we are also making the force to join the Financial Action Task Force, so that uh, we'll be able to work on the issue of terrorist financing, we'll be able to work on the issue of money laundering, much better than we are doing currently. And of course, we know that Nigeria is a, is a member of the Group of Financial Intelligence, so that we, we, we share all of this uh, information. Um, in Nigeria, even our financial intelligence we need to work every day on the issue of um, suspicious uh, currency transactions. And every bank is supposed, at the end of the, uh, the day, uh, working day, at the close of every day, submit every suspicious uh, transactions report to the AFI for a further uh, scrutiny and investigation. So we are doing all this to ensure that and tell the whole world that Nigeria is changing and the, the days of uh, lack of political will, those days are over. Now we have political will. Now we are committed. We are passing the laws that will give legal backing to all the uh, to all the other clubs and agencies that we have in Nigeria. Also in the process, I know we will be talking, you'll be asking because tomorrow the institution room will be talking about the whistleblowers uh, whistleblowers uh, bill and what are we doing? Because we cannot talk of exposing corruption without also engaging the general public. I have said it over and over that fighting corruption without the assistance of the general public is as like trying to control erosion with just uh, a, a, a paper. It cannot work. So uh, we need people to supply information, we need people to give us relevant information that will help anti-corruption agencies in their investigation. And that's where the issue of the whistleblowers protection comes in. And right now, what we have is the policy that encourages people to bring information. And when they bring information, we also have the policy of giving them some, um, some sort of money that will encourage them so that uh, they can come forward again. But uh, beyond that, uh, the families of the whistleblowers, they themselves, they need protection. And in order to do that, we need to uh, give legal backing to uh, the whistleblowers' protection. And right now, uh, we have uh, pending at the National Assembly the whistleblowers' protection bill. Um, yesterday, I attended um, a seminar we told that the one in the Senate has been passed. Uh, the, the one here in the House of Representatives has not been passed. We've gone through the second reading. I believe last year we had, a, we had a, 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 a workshop where experts came from even France and Europe and the UK and other parts of the world to attend. Interesting, they look good. Aha. So a lot of people were in attendance so that we all went through uh, the scope of the law of the bill that we are trying to pass. And I know that uh, before this administration has up in uh, June next year, it's May 29th for executives, but it's, it's June 9, maybe June 8 or June 9 for us here in the legislation. So we don't wind up at the same time. The next administration will meet us after we do it, that will be like a transition. So before we do that, I believe that the visual class protection bill should be passed sent to the president for its consent. So everything we are doing and is just to ensure that we have a corrupt free uh, nation and uh, I have 
having said that, which again we want to welcome at the National Assembly. Tomorrow is situation room. I understand I'm going to chair that event, so I won't say anything that for now. Uh, I understand you'll be there. So I will keep a few things I want to say, but we'll get to the other side. Thank you, thank you, sir.